welcome to the Service Drive Revolution podcast with your hosts, Chris, the Bulldog Collins, and Gary Daniel, the G-Man. Welcome to Service Drive Revolution. I'm your host, Chris Collins, and my co-host, Gary Daniels, better known as G-Man. Now, recently, Gary and I went to San Diego and interviewed Jocko Willick, who's going to be a speaker at our upcoming Top Dog event here in Los Angeles, where the top service managers and advisors from all over the country get together and workshop for a couple days. And now, if you don't know about Jocko, he was a Navy SEAL for two decades. He fought in Iraq, where he was highly decorated and his unit there was task unit bruiser which was instrumental in retaking and stabilizing the city of ramadi and just on top of that just a cool name task unit bruiser and after iraq jocko became an officer in charge of the navy special warfare detachment for three years where he oversaw the training for all the west coast navy seals and from his work in Iraq, he was awarded numerous medals, including the bronze and silver stars. Now, how we came to know Jocko is by reading his his book, which is a New York Times bestseller. The name of it is Extreme Ownership, How U.S. Navy SEALs Lead and Win. And it's an amazing book, best book on leadership I think I've read in the last five years. And if you haven't read it, it it's a must read. And Jocko currently has a... a company called echelon front where they do leadership and consulting for businesses and that's it's um he makes parallels in the book and in in his leadership training from the battlefield to business and in the stories and the analogies are are amazing now it's hard to not appreciate on top of the great leadership training and and everything that we learn from jocko it's also hard not to just really appreciate the fact that guys like Jocko are out there, you know, representing our country and sacrificing what they do because it's not about the money and it's very selfless and love of country when they serve in the military at the level that they do. So we owe him a huge, you know, a huge amount of gratitude for that also. And everybody else who serves it's, it's, you know, awe inspiring, that these guys are, are out there protecting us. So you're going to enjoy this podcast. Jocko was very generous. We learned a lot from him and it was a lot of fun. So enjoy. Hey, welcome everybody to the podcast with the world famous Jocko and G man. Um, Jocko, Hello. you're kind of like Madonna in that you're, it's kind of one name, really Jocko. I guess there's not that many Jockos in the world. No, it's yeah, it's, good. it's a brand. It's a brand now, Jocko. And then um, G-Man, I recently got my cholesterol back. Mm. Do you have your cholesterol checked regularly? I haven't had it checked in a while, but I eat and live pretty clean. So it's not like a huge factor for me that I'm thinking about all the time. So we consider tequila a food group. <laughs> and so we're getting checked quite frequently. And you need to have it with every meal, Weekly. by the way. It's got to be there. We have tequila right over there, actually. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so I started working with Chris in the office, and uh, he's got this doctor, Dr. Lau. And Dr. Lau's like a, his whole goal is to, is to make, uh, and he's only for men, and to make your every day the best day possible. So he doesn't want you to have bad days. And so he runs this blood panel on you, and then he'll go through and figure out ways that you can kind of improve your chemistry. And um, so he runs a panel on me when I first got there. It was pretty, it was pretty bad. And so he gives me this regimen and everything. I start working out with Chris every day. We go to, every morning we go to the gym. So I'm working out, I'm eating right, I'm losing weight. I was on the road for two years, so I, I put on like 25 pounds. And I was eating French fries with every meal, <laughs> French fries and hamburgers with every meal. I, I, don't, I can't even laugh at that. Oh, it's bad. <laughs> I don't like that. <laughs> I can't even laugh at that. I don't like that at all. I can laugh uh, at it. So anyway, so all right. So I'm, uh, in my, I got the best wife on the planet. So she gets up at 4 o'clock in the morning and presses fresh juice for me, fresh vegetable juice, and puts them in these mason jars, packs it, protein shake. Um, and you know, and she it's p- like packs my ginger lunch. and like beets and yeah. like everything. It smells like it's you know, yeah, so good I'm, for you. I've been feeling good. I'm I'm getting in better shape. I feel better. Uh, I start riding my bike again. Things are going well. So I get my next blood test, which I think is going to go well. 
And uh, this time I'm on the phone with Dr. Lau and Dr. Lau's like, I just, I can't believe it. He goes, you like, we got to do something. Change your diet today. Like you got to stop eating Carl's Jr. You got to stop. You got to get on the treadmill. Like, he starts telling me all this stuff. I said, I, whoa, 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 Dr. Lau. I, I'm, I'm drinking vegetable juice three times a day. Like I, I'm eating clean. I don't, I don't understand. He goes, well, when I look at your blood, what I see on the other side of the phone is a guy that's 300 pounds and eats Carl's Jr. for lunch every single day. <laughs> I'm like, oh my God. So I don't so know. So my, my theory is that he should go the other way and his blood type probably answers to milkshakes and cheeseburgers better <laughs> and the healthy <laughs> stuff is what's killing him. Yeah. Maybe. I don't know. It's I don't know. Little... I cut all that stuff out. My cholesterol didn't move. When, when you say you cut all that stuff out, what did you cut out? I stopped eating. I mean, really, you stopped eating out. Stopped eating French fries and burgers every day, mm -hmm. and um, started eating more chicken. You know, um, vegetables, brown rice, pasta. Um, so, just, just FYI, you might want to check in there cutting out all those carbohydrates. When you say brown rice and pasta, mm -hmm. that stuff is not good for you. Yeah, he eats a lot of carbs. I yeah. do. I'm probably still eat too many carbs. And we drink too much. Yeah. Yeah, and the alcohol thing too. That's you know, it's not good. We yeah. need to go on a, on a um, fast on that. I think. Yeah. yeah. So, so um, we're super excited, Jocko, that we have you at our Top Dog event this year. And I was telling you, we give your book away. We have a stack of them in our office. When people come in, we give them away. Best leadership book I've read, in I mean, you know, five plus years. And the thing that got me when I started reading the book, the thing that got me is. The way that you wrote it is like you you give an analogy from war and then you relate it to a business lesson. And the thing that I got right away in it was like we're such pussies in business because the first story you tell is life and death. And then it's like, oh, yeah, and in the boardroom. And it, it's, it's crazy how leadership, um, how terrible leadership is nowadays and how it's life and death, really, when when you're talking about it in your book. It's yeah, you know what, and I usually have to explain that to people when we start working with customers that we work with, and for me, customers are businesses that, that want help with their leadership and management. So when we start talking to them, a lot, of the, a lot of times, they'll throw something at me along those lines, such as, well, you know, when you were overseas, you were dealing with life and death, and you know, we're just dealing with you know, paychecks. And I always throw back at them that, well, we, we were dealing with lives, but you're dealing with livelihoods, you know? And, and, and so if I take away your mortgage payment and I take away your ability to feed your kid, I mean, that's, that's your life. That's what mm -hmm. you do. So even though it might not be as extreme as life and death, it is a person's livelihood and it's how they make their money. It's how they pay their mortgage. It's how they feed their kids. It's how they take care of their, their family. And so when you take that away from them because you failed as a business leader, that has a huge impact and why that's why that's what causes stress in business you know that's what causes stress in business that's what causes stress in combat from a leadership perspective in combat what worried me was something happening to my guys that that's what worried me it wasn't it wasn't about me like oh i hope i don't get wounded i hope i don't get killed i didn't care about that what worries you is can you take care of your guys are they going to be okay and so as a business leader when you're in charge of a business you know, okay, maybe you're concerned a little bit about your own financial good, but your real concern should be, am I taking care of the people that are trusting me and, and counting on me to lead them? And that's, that's a lot of pressure regardless of, of what the business is. Yeah, and I think on the flip side of that is the companies or leaders living up to their full potential because the things that you lay out there as a roadmap and some of the recipes that you give, and a lot of it is mindset, but the, the mindset is the company's living up to their full potential and not just being average, which there's the, the part of, you know, losing, but really um, most leaders don't understand that their full potential is probably four times what they're doing. At uh, least. Absolutely. You, you, every human has better, they can do better than they're doing right now. Every, yeah. everybody in the world can do better than they're doing right now. So recognizing that, and then it can be, it, it's, it's a big step and it takes work hard work to to improve especially the better you get the harder it is to improve more so the better you get the more you have to work to get better so it's it's a challenge and that's why you do find people that are okay with being average they're okay with being okay 
And that to me, that's not a good way to go through life. That's that top twenty no. percent is always the hardest. Like getting them to move into that eighty percent range is usually you can pull a big lever and they'll move really fast. But yeah, that top that top right. part's really hard to get there. You gotta have a lot of discipline. Yeah, and we're we're very much conditioned in our country that average is okay. A lot of things that are a lot of things that are taught and that are said are, you know, in the tone of keeping us average. And we do it to ourselves more mm -hmm. more than anything else. That's very disturbing. So yeah. when you come into a, a company, you know, like you were talking about, and you want to get those guys to move and to do things, do you ever get, how much pushback do you get when you come in? Like, it seems like there would be, is there egos involved? How do you get past that? Well, you can definitely get egos. There's always egos involved in every mm -hmm. situation. But it, most of the time, when we're talking to people, th there might be a couple, a small percentage of people that, that will give some pushback. But most of the people are saying, yeah, yep, that's right. Yes, I wish we would do that. Yes, I could do that better. These the things that we're talking about aren't aren't revelations, right? right? They're not revelations and they're not usually not radically different from what people already know. Mm -hmm. So, I didn't invent anything new, but through the application of those simple things, simple not easy. You know, that's another thing right. I, that we wrote in the book. It's simple not easy. These things are simple to understand. They're not easy to execute. Yeah. We were talking about that the other day and the it's funny, we were just talking about the nutrition part of it. And there's this you know billion dollar weight loss industry and all these books written in a million different diets on how to do it. And really this thing is simple. there's a new discovery how to lose weight. <laughs> yeah. It's new from NASA on how you lose weight and get in shape. Yeah, work out and eat less and <laughs> eat the right foods and you know yeah, exercise the, more. It's hard to find somebody who doesn't know how to lose weight and it's yeah. doing it yeah. is the problem. Everybody knows how to do it. So right. the strength is like having a coach like yourself, right? Is that, that what you guys bring into those organizations and kind of being able to carve out the path for them and clear the force and get them through? Well, sometimes I think it's an, an, an analogy I use a lot or a story I talk about a lot is the, the movie Terminator. And in the movie Terminator, the first one, it says somewhere in there, it says the beginning opening narration says in August 27th, 2023, the machines became aware. And a lot of this is about awareness and, and people are going through the motions and they're just not aware of the mistakes that they're making. So when we point out, hey, this is the situation that you have going on and here's what's causing it. And they go, mm, I kind of knew that. Yeah, they kind of knew that. But when, they, when we explain it to them and show it to them and, and hold up the mirror so they can see it for themselves, it becomes very obvious. And, and you know, the first part in winning any battle is recognizing the enemy and identifying them and knowing where they are. And so when you become aware of your own faults and your own mistakes that you're making, that's when you can finally begin to take the steps towards improvement. Yeah, that's, that's good. good. And by the way, you have a voice for movies. You could be doing those <laughs> intros <laughs> from Star Wars. Um, so what, what characteristics do you see between the businesses that you work with that perform at a high level and the ones that struggle? What are the, what are the different um, characteristics between the two? It's the same bulk of problems that people have and there's a variety but i'll tell you that the number one thing and this goes with people ask me all the time what's the, what's the most important characteristic of a leader they say well about a business you know what is the, just the same question that you just asked me i get asked that question a lot and the key component that i always talk about is humility and That's when right. you lack humility what that does to your personality and thereby does to your team's personality is is immensely impactful so when you're not humble so you, that means you think you're the best. That means you think I can't do anything better. I'm, you know, I'm doing the, the best that anyone can do. That means you're not listening to anybody else. That means you're not taking any suggestions from anybody else. That means you're not even, you're not even doing a, a, a self-assessment, a critical, honest self-assessment and saying, hey, what could I do? No, no, you're thinking you're doing everything great. So, so right there, oh yeah, what do you think about your competitor or, or the enemy? You know, for us, from the battlefield, it's the enemy. What do you think of the enemy? We're smarter than them. We're better than them. We don't have to worry about them. What do you think about in business world? What do you think about your competitor? Oh, we're, we're the best. We're, we're, the, we're the industry leaders. And so, therefore, we don't have to work hard. And so then we, then we can start cutting corners. Then we can start taking shortcuts. Then we can start to rely and rest on our laurels. And so that's the difference between people that excel and people that don't is 
the people that excel are constantly saying, what can I do better? How can I improve? I better watch out behind me because the enemy's trying to sneak up on me. The competitors are trying to sneak up on me. I'm going to work today harder than they're working. And that's how, that's, that's the huge difference between people that excel and people that don't. Yeah. And they're willing to take, they're willing to take feedback and oh. process it. And then, yeah. Yeah. They don't yeah, take it personally. I've, I've heard you say that before, Chris, too, that you like people that are hungry and humble. Yeah, hungry. Hungry, humble. want to climb that mountain, and then humble. They got humility, right? Yeah, because without that, you just don't. Then you, you don't see the mountain. Like You think you're at the top of it already. Indeed. Yeah. What, what would you say, Jocko, is the one thing when you walk into a business scenario, what is the one thing that you see that everybody else doesn't see? Well, immediately you have an outside perspective, which is very helpful. Now, I, as an individual, I call this being able to detach yourself. So in other words, when you're on the battlefield, you're out there and there's all kinds of mayhem happening. There's craziness happening. There's people wounded. There's people dying. There's, there's things blowing up. There's bullets flying around. And if you get emotional and get your head goes into that scenario, all of your head goes into that scenario, you can no longer make good, clean decisions because you're emotional, your, your mind is trapped in the chaos, you're not percep perceiving what's really happening around you because of, the, because of the things that are going on are so overwhelming. And so what you have to do as an individual is you have to be able to detach from all that. You have to be able to step back and say, okay, here's what's happening. I'm not going to be emotional right now. I'm going to look at the things as they are, and I'm going to make decisions based on what's really happening, not on emotions and chaos. And so when we walk into a company, that's the first advantage that we have that most of the companies don't have is they're in it. They're in the firefight. They're, they've got the chaos going on. They don't see those egos. Those, I walk into those companies and I can see these, you know, you talked about egos earlier. Mm -hmm. I can see these egos. They're very clear of who's got them and who's, who they're rubbing up against and who, who they're offending. And so it becomes very easy to walk in and say, okay, I'm, that's because I'm walking in, I'm already detached. I'm, I'm de facto detached from the situation. I'm not part of the company. So we're able to come in and look and assess very easily to see where the friction points are and what we have to do to fix them. Yeah, I, I think um, we have a, a painting in our office that says you can't le read the label of the jar you're in. <laughs> and it's, it's always, you know, a fresh set of eyes. And I'll tell people, like we're really not that smart. What it is is we're a fresh set of eyes and we get to go to all these other companies and see what they're doing and what isn't working. And then we're sharing that with you. And, you know, we have some basic fundamental skills, but we're observant. Like yeah. we just, we're students right. more than anything. And that we're is the danger. Geniuses. I mean, I did, I traveled for a couple of years, you know, consulting and you're out there kind of on your own. And when you first get there, you get the freshest perspective, you know, you get to see it. But when you've been at that company for a year and you're showing up there month after month, it that you do get to that point where you almost kind of get sucked into their you reality. You become a part of the yeah. the team, and then you're not you're not as fresh. You can't be objective anymore. And so we talk about that with our group. And we with flip our guys. our guys. Yeah, we got it's like you got to pull back. And I love that that chapter in your book where you talk about that. I think you bust through a door and there's a bunch of guys and there's a lot of chaos going on. And you you literally almost physically I think took a step back and right. had to assess the situation and. Um, I just think that is just so such a clear example of what you have to do, you know, is just you really literally got to get out, you know, from a 30,000 foot view and look down on the battlefield and see what's going on. I think you tell that story on a podcast. I don't think it's in the book, but you talk about taking somebody up on a hill and you were watching the battlefield from up there and you're like, this is where you really see it. Right, right. And that was just one of the guys that that had worked for me and now he had stepped up and taken my position. And to make a long story short, yeah, we, we were out there watching this. It was training. We were watching this training event happen. And we have all kinds of chaos going on in the training. And it's so obvious when you step back. We weren't even on top of a hill. We weren't on top of a hill. We, we stepped back, you know, 20 meters. That's all it took was just, just 20 meters out of the chaos. And the, every, the answer is so obvious when you're out there. And he, he looked at me and said, you know, wow, it's so easy to see from here. And, and. I said, and when we went through, when we were going through training together, and he was a guy with me, and we were in the jar, so to speak, we were in the chaos, I still just stepped back mentally, a little bit physically, maybe you can't get 20 meters, but you can get three meters, and you can change your perspective, and you can open your mind, open your ears, open your eyes, you can dislodge your, your emotion, and you can make a much better assessment, and everything, again, the answer becomes very clear when you aren't caught up in all that. Yeah, you can train your mind to go there quicker when you're 
when you're aware of it. That I loved that analogy when you talked about going up on the hill, though, that um, you have to mentally do that even if you're in it. It's funny. The one question we wanted to ask you was about your kids and them serving in the military. What advice would you give them? The same advice I give everybody. Be humble, work hard. <laughs> you know, I, I don't think I've got three daughters and one son. I don't think my daughters are going to go in the military. They might. I, I don't know. My son, I think, is more encouraged by or he likes the idea of going to the military. You know, he's kind of seen my life and said, that looks like it was pretty fun. <laughs> you know, he, he's a kid that likes being outside, likes to surf, likes to shoot guns. You know, I can't. I, when I was a kid, did I, did I think about, hey, it'd be really fun to go to a, an office somewhere and sit in a cubicle and look at a computer screen. I, I never thought that. I never had that idea. I thought to myself, you know what would be cool? Jumping out of airplanes and hucking grenades at people. That would be cool. That's what I want to do. And so it's no shocker to me that my son kind of has the same type of feeling. I think a lot of boys have that feeling. And if, and, but at the same time, I'm trying not to pressure him to go in. I'd want him to make the decision on his own. And if he makes that decision, that's cool. If he doesn't make that decision, he wants to go do something else, that's cool too. I, I try not to put massive expectations on the kids. Try not to do that. It's hard not to, you know, because yeah. you want your kids to be, you know, the, 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 the president of the United States of America and everything else. But you, you have to, if you try and put that on them, they're probably going to end up with, you know, not good situation. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, it's uh, my wife and I were talking about that. We, I have, I have two kids, a boy and a girl, and they're uh, 19 and 20 now. And so we were saying they, uh, you know, we, 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 you know, push them to do better in school and to try to, you know, excel and, um, and, you know, keep talking to them about trying to get into college and doing the, the thing that, you know, all parents tell their kids to do. And so then they get accepted. And my, you know, my wife's like, well, this is going to cost a lot of money. I don't know. Can we do this? And I'm like, well, we told them for the last 12 years, like they got to do this. Like, you, I don't know. It's time to pony up. <laughs> yeah. So they're both in college. Now. That's good. Well, good for you. I think that's one of the things that, that I think mistake that parents make is they don't just like, just like business leaders or military leaders, they don't explain why something is important to their kids. So in, in, they say, you need to go to college, you need to get to go to college. And, and, and they never, kids never connect that. They, they say to themselves, well, that sounds like four more years of high school to me. That doesn't sound like a good deal. I want to go out and, you know, make money and get a job. But we don't explain to the kids why this is important. You know, what we'll do in the long run, how much money you'll be able to make in the future if you do go to college. And, and that's not necessarily the right path for everybody. I mean, I think in this day and age, I think there's a lot of a generation of kids that are coming up if they make this move and they go become an electrician or a metal worker or a, or a plumber, they're going to end up more in demand than a lawyer or a software developer because because guess what? Everyone's trying to become a, a lawyer, a software developer, a, a finance guy. Well, who's going to, who's going to fix your toilet is my question. <laughs> who's going to, who's going to rewire your house? Who's going to fix your car? You know, who's going to do that? Yeah. And so I think there's going to be a generation possibly in the uh, coming years of people that decide to go more in the trade route. And I think they're actually going to be very successful. Yeah. I was a, I was a mechanic for 15. So that's how I started my well, there career. You go. And, uh, yeah, and it was good. It did very well for me. I took care of me and my family. It was a good business. Um, and uh, that's what we talk about now. When I came into the business, I was the only apprentice in a shop full of master techs. And now, like, it's just so hard to find people that want to do that job. And I agree with you. I think that's the coming trend has got to be those jobs are going to get more in demand. I think the income potential for that's going to get higher. Absolutely. And people are going to start going into that. It's, it's a good field. It's just, it's just, it's a dirty business. You know, it's not glamorous. And not everybody wants to do that. And everybody wants to sit behind a computer screen and create, you know, apps and games and they just don't want to they don't want to get their knuckles dirty what kind of cars do you have i have well my pride and joy is a 1974 ford econoline quadravan which is a four-wheel drive factory four-wheel drive uh van mm -hmm. that was made in the 70s so that's that's like my like Starsky it, and Hutch kind of van. It's it's Scooby you, you ever seen it? the 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 Ford Econolines at that time had the this the snub nose, so it's like a really flat nose, and the uh, the engine is right in between the seats. It's uh yeah. it's a pretty awesome. Is it vehicle. lifted the big tires? Yeah, like it's that. it's yeah. lifted with big tires. It's 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 
turning into a project. So I need mm-hmm. to. I've got a ton of work to uh, to get done on it. I, I, yeah. But that's Do you work on it yourself. I did work on it myself, um, but right now I don't have the time. You know, you either have time or money. Yep. And right now I have more money than time. Mm. So I got to find if I'm going to, that's why I'm holding off. It's something that I've kind of wanted to do myself, but now I'm thinking, okay, do I do it myself? Do I wait or do I do it, you know, pay somebody to do it now? That kind of thing. And then I told my son, I said, Hey, you know, this could be, this could be your, your chariot of glory in years to come. <laughs> if you want if you want to break out the wrenches and make it happen. <laughs> so uh, it's funny. This is what you get, son. This is what I'm handing down. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> the kid, does your son want to do it? Does he like the wrenches? He's, he's been fired up, but I would say he's not got the craftsman gene. Mm-hmm. And so I don't know. We'll see. Um, and you know, this, these day and age, they, there's not a lot of, you know, when, when, when we all went to school, at least when I went to school, you know, you could take, auto shop you could take wood shop you could take metal shop all those things are gone yeah. they're writing code yeah they're yeah, writing code now yep yeah. so unfortunately you know he can't bring it into school and working on it as a project in his freshman and, and sophomore year and his junior year when he gets his license he's the man yeah right right the man with the van instead <laughs> maybe he can program apps i don't know <laughs> That's fun. that's funny the um one commonality that that i seeing in, in top performers and i i call it like i i feel like um sometimes i'm sadistic but you were talking about this in something else i heard about how when you're going through seal training like you like you the harder it is the more you like it am i saying that right but you were saying like when everybody else was struggling you're like that's the fun part for me yeah i i think that and again i was i always say this that seal training when you're in the SEAL team, SEAL training is just no big deal. No one cares about SEAL training. And and in the civilian world, people think SEAL training is a big deal. But, you know, you compare it to SEAL training, which is, hey, I had to carry a log around and put a boat on my head and I had to run and swim a bunch. And it was hard and it was cold and I didn't get to sleep a lot. Okay, that, that, that sounds real rough, right? Well, then you compare that to combat where I got guys rolling out for their sixth night in a row into downtown Ramadi on a foot patrol where they got in three firefights over the last three nights and they're going to get in another one tonight. There's IEDs all over the place. They could get killed. They know it. I know it. We all know it. And and so the SEAL training thing is just sort of like whatever. Some people make a big deal out of it. It's just it's not that big of a deal. But back to your question, yes, I want things to be hard. I'm looking for a, a, a challenge. I want to push myself. I want to push my team and get after it. So w- when you're going through SEAL training and people are quitting, again, you're. Wa- I mean, I was watching people that are quitting because they don't want to be cold. They don't want to be wet. They don't want to be tired. Hey, right. Okay, cool. You can quit. I'm actually going to gonna take possession of your soul and use it to my own build my own strength up and become more of a destroyer that's what i'm gonna do so, it's so that's so funny jocko because you're like it's you know it's seal training it's not that hard but isn't it like what's the percentage of guys that make it through there's like an 80 percent attrition rate yeah so there's 80 percent of people that if i was sitting here they'd be like oh my god it was the worst thing ever. Well, that's that's one way of looking at it but a hundred percent of my friends made it through so the guys that i knew that were good dudes a hundred percent make it through mm. It's eighty percent of. So the other guys look like Gary and I. <laughs> <laughs> I. Actually, I think. I mean, I think if I committed to it, I'd make it through. It, it would just have to be something I wanted to do. Yeah, that's a, we we were talking about this yesterday. Is I have this flaw that um, I won't do something unless I know I'm going to win, and I've been that way since I was a kid. Mm-hmm. And we were debating whether that's good or bad. I, I probably is a little bit of both. But if I, I think if I decided to do it, I would do it. Like there would be no quitting. But I'd think about it really hard before I committed. Yeah, it's really difficult to tell who's going to make it through and who's not. It goes beyond are you going to quit or not. There's actual physical limitations that human bodies have, and they're weird. For instance, we had a guy in my SEAL training class that was a NCAA water polo team captain and champion. So the guy was a physical stud. But for whatever reason, he didn't have strong forearm grips. So he couldn't climb ropes and hang on to ladders. And they just broke him down on the obstacle course, which is a very grip intensive. And he just quit. And so here's a guy that's a way better athlete than I am. But he just had this one weakness 
that made him quit. The other thing that happens is people get injured. People get pneumonia. People get hypothermia. People get stress fractures. So there's there's a whole litany of things that can catch you that have nothing to do with your your will to make it through. Now your will to make it and not quit definitely goes a, a decent distance. But I can't even if I knew you were you were a completely committed person that's you know never quits and anything. I still can't give you. I still wouldn't put any money on it. I can't put money on. I can't put money on anybody going through SEAL training. Just like I can't put any money on people going into combat and what they're going to be like. That's a yeah, durability. It's a hundred. It's a hundred percent chance that I would decide that it, I didn't want to do it anyway. <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't. I mean, I just didn't. You. Um, you know. You know when you grow up as a kid, like there's just certain things like you wanted to do that. It wasn't my my passion was something something else. But in so how much of that? Because that's an interesting thing that that you're saying. How much of it is mental and how much of it is just physical and, lo- and luck of not getting hypothermia? It's both because if you can't climb a rope physically, it doesn't matter how, men- how much mentally you want to climb the rope. If you can't do it physically, you're not going to make it. But you don't know that before you get there? You do. And you could, so you could put that back on the mental side and say, well, if you know and you're mentally tough, then you're going to train yourself to a certain point. But there's people that break down that don't make it through and... They're, they're, they physically break. They physically break and they can't make it. And there's also some, also some people that are really gifted athletes, they're making it, they are making it through more based on their physical attributes than their mental attributes. Mm-hmm. Now you get a kid that's a horrible athlete that's slow and weak, but he's good enough. He's going to make it through on his mental toughness and his grit. So it varies for different people what's going to get him through. What was your favorite part of that, of the training? I loved it all. I thought it was all fun. You know, one of the, the, there's a week in there called Hell Week, which is, you know, where they keep you weak for, f- for five days and you do physical evolutions the whole time and you're not allowed to sleep. And everyone's scared of that. And that's where, there's, that's where a vast majority of the people that quit, quit during that week. And to me, that week was a joke because it was very easy for me because all you had to do is keep going. There, all you had to do is keep going and you, and you make it. It wasn't, there's, there's, you run, but there's no time limit on the run. You swim, but there's no time limit on the swim. You have to paddle the boats all over the place, but there's no time limit on getting there. So you just have to keep going. And they're trying to break you mentally, and I wasn't breaking mentally. So it was just, it was, it was a fun time for me. I was laughing. <laughs> That's awesome. When, when you're training to be a Navy SEAL, how much of it is physical and how much of it is the mental and like, I would call it like, school book part where they're where you're reading and learning the the mental side of it not you know diving and jumping well the first part when you go through the seal the basic seal training is 95 percent physical that's what it is you learn a little bit of stuff along the way but it's nothing important and they're basically making sure that you have a, a functioning brain <laughs> that's all they're doing can you figure out dive physics can you figure out the the weapon systems and know the nomenclature of the weapon system so you do that but that's all again that's just basic memorization almost so but but none of that really matters and then you get to the seal teams which is where you actually become a seal where you actually learn the tactics techniques procedures that make you into a seal that learns how to close with and destroy the enemy learn small unit tactics learn fire and maneuver that's that's the stuff and that stuff is all mental there's a, there's a small little bit of physical stuff on it, but it's, it's almost all mental of how to, okay, here's where the enemy is, here's where I am, here's where my team is, here's where my supporting elements are, here's how I'm going to move these pieces on the chessboard to win this situation. And that is, a, that is all mental. Now, part of the reason it feels like it's all mental is because your physical baseline has to be good enough that just because you're carrying a heavy load and sweating and getting dehydrated and moving at a high rate of speed through long distances... You're, you're not going to pay attention to that and you're going to be mentally aware and paying attention and, again, learning how to move those chess pieces on the battlefield. So there is a physical component that's a baseline that's just always present, but the mental training is then, is then a, uh, the primary part of it, especially for the guys in the leadership positions, which everybody in the SEAL teams, as they come up through the SEAL teams, they grow and advance into more and more leadership positions. The um, p- Pardon my ignorance because I've never been... You know, I don't understand it all, but the the one thing when you're dropped in somewhere on a mission and there's like a small group of you, like six or eight on a special mission, in your experience, 
was there ever a time where it was hard getting out? Sometimes it is. So how do you get out when it's... Just, it just depends on the situation. It just depends on the situation and, and where you've been placed. And you know what? One thing that we do well, though, is we plan contingencies so that we would look at a situation and say, oh, we're going to this location. This seems like a place where bad things could happen. It seems like a place we might not be able to get helicopters into this spot. So let's figure out a way that let's have a secondary location that we can get to. Let's have a, a way to bring in close air support that can come from the sky and drop bombs and then give us provide cover while we bring helicopters in. Or we can have a secondary place we can pick picked up by vehicles. Or so we will we will plan accordingly to prevent as much as possible getting into a situation where where we're feeling like we we can't get out of here. We're gonna plan accordingly. Was there a situation um, in reference to getting out where you were on like the third contingency? Well, I think a great story in the book that Leif, and Leif is the, the guy that wrote the book with me, Leif Babin, he was one of the platoon commanders that worked for me in, in Ramadi, in our deployment to Ramadi, Iraq, and then he's my business partner. And he wrote a great story in there, and they were in an overwatch position, which meant they had snipers, they were watching an area of Ramadi looking for bad guys, killing bad guys. And the enemy, while they, and this was in a building, so they're in a big building, and while they're in the building, um, an enemy came and planted an IED outside the front door. So the, the guys are EOD guys, explosive ordnance disposal, guys that do, that, you know, look, look out for bombs and try and keep us safe from stepping on IEDs. Those guys spotted it before the platoon broke out and left the building. So luckily they saw it. And they said, okay, now what are we gonna do? How are we gonna get out of here? Well, for whatever reason, this building had one door. And that was the only door. And this, the bomb was right outside the door. And so Leif and his guys sat there and thought about it. How, what can we do? Well, we can't, we, you know, if we walk out the front door, they're probably gonna have an ambush. They got the bomb, but it's gonna be bad. So what else can we do? How can we get out of here? Can we put, can we rappel out one of the windows? And what they ended up doing was getting out their sledgehammers and sledgehammering through a concrete wall to get in, to get out of the building from another from another egress route. So so there's a good example of hey we're in a really bad situation. How are we going to get out of here? Oh I know how we're going to get out. We're going to get out sledgehammers and pound through this concrete wall until we make a man sized hole and we're going to crawl out. Literally smash through a wall. Yep. <laughs> to get to the objective. It's, Breaking it's, down walls. That's good. That's good. So I, I if I can shift gears for just a minute and. Uh, um, in the book, you know, you talk about mentors and people that you had with you when you were in the military. And then I was listening to your podcast with uh, um, Steve Austin. Mm -hmm. And you were talking about when you came out and you started to get um, recognized. Somebody asked you to speak mm -hmm. to a group of managers or leaders and um, share some of the principles that you learned. And then it kind of grew and started to escalate from there and you grew a business out of it. Did you have a mentor? So then when you said, hey, man, this, this, I got something here. This could be a business. Um, did you have somebody that helped you, that walked you through it, a mentor that kind of showed you the path? No. No, none on the business end of it? Nobody that? No. Nope. Now you just. I, now, what I did have was good relationships with people that were in the business world. And as I talked to them and uncovered things, and it, it, plus it all just makes sense. It's mm -hmm. leadership. The fundamental principles of leadership, they don't change. Uh, do they nuance? Yes. Are there little variations? Yes. But the fundamental principles of leadership, they don't change whether you're on the battlefield or you're in business. They just don't, or you're running a, a, a eight-year-old and under girls soccer team. The leadership principles stay the same. I, I don't care what, I don't care what situation you are. Leading humans is a, there's a science to it. Now there's also a, an art to it. There's an absolute art to it. And so you have to understand the science and you have to know the fundamentals and you have to, understand the disciplines of the science in order to become an artist and start to work those nuances. It's like, you know, you were showing me earlier a guy that's a woodworker. Well, the fundamental principles of woodworking are the same, but this guy gets a, every piece of wood is different. It's got a different grain to it. It's got knots in it. It's got all these different types of wood. You know, I've got wood at my house, Brazilian Ipe, that's, that's four times harder than teak. So there's, the principles are the same, but you have to use certain techniques. And it's the same thing with being a leader. The principles are going to stay the same, but the techniques that you use and the tools that you use to lead people are going to vary and change, but they, all, they, but they won't violate the basic principles of leadership. 
Yeah. We we always say you're painting in Picasso. Like it is. You you have to it's the timing, it's it's all of it at one time. Um, especially when we're trying to turn something around really fast, the timing is a big part of it. Yeah. You have to do everything. You can't there's just certain stages that if you don't do it, it doesn't get momentum. And once you have momentum it it's hard to stop. But um yeah, we say paint, painting in Picasso. It is art. Um and that's the fun part is great leaders are it is like art like steve jobs it was art in a way mm -hmm. yeah and I, I think a good example is jimmy page from led zeppelin are you familiar with him oh yeah okay he was a studio musician for many many years meaning they told him play this piece of paper right here you follow this music and he did it and he did it perfectly for all those years and he was highly disciplined and he understood the fundamentals of music but then when he, in Led Zeppelin, you know, he was able to just take that and now create. And that's why, you know, he's considered to be one of the greatest guitarists of all time because he knew those fundamentals so well that when he broke out and, and set his mind free, he was able to just express in a, in a way that many people haven't been able to do. Yeah, he, yeah and in a lot of ways, he kind of reinvented some of it with his approach to it. What kind of music do you listen to? I listen to primarily heavy metal and old specifically school. which bands? Well, I mean, we're talking about Led Zeppelin, but Black Sabbath would, would likely be my my all time favorite. Actually, it would be. Oh, see, I thought you were going to go heavier than that. So, yeah, that makes sense. Gary's Journey, Foreigner. What else? <laughs> I'm sorry to hear that. I always tell him he's always making it can't be all Journey, bro. Come on, bro. Journey what comes you, on in a bar. Everybody goes nuts. What do you People think about insane. Kanye? Who's that? Uh, he's just a <laughs> rap guy. He's married to Kim Kardashian. No? Nah. He's actually pretty good. I like him. But he's pushing He's pushing some boundaries for sure. Cool. Anything else, Jermaine? So when I went to high school, I was in the weightlifting class. You know, I lifted a lot when I was in high school. It was always... Everybody always wanted to know what your bench was. Mm -hmm. So I am curious. So Chris and I lift at the gym. We do a lot of, you know, power cleans and deadlifts and all that stuff. So I'm curious, uh, bench and squat. Do you have a number? I don't bench a lot anymore. No. Uh, I just, you know, my shoulders, I just don't find it to be good for my shoulders. Um, if you're, if you ever train any jujitsu, there's certain moves in jujitsu that are actual submission holds that make you tap and submit because they're hurting your shoulder. Mm -hmm. And some of them are very similar to the bench press. Uh, but you know, I I don't know, I think the most I've ever benched is like 350. I'm not a very strong bencher. Um, I can deadlift around 500 wow. and uh, you know, squat. You know, I do a lot of higher rep squat mm -hmm. uh, where I, and I, and I also am very particular about full range of motion all the way down for my squats. But yeah, I, I squat you know, some, some higher reps with a decent weight. Mm -hmm. Is that your routine though? You do mostly like t powerlifting exercises like that? Like I do squats calisthenics. And... I do, you know, I have rings. I have rings at my house. So I do all kinds of gymnastics type. I, I, that's a stretch because you, gymnasts are actually, uh, you know, incredibly, <laughs> they do a lot more than what I p play around with, but I have rings at my house. I have, you know, bumper plates. So I squat, clean deadlift mm -hmm. clean and jerk snatch i have kettlebells i have a rowing machine i have i live by the beach i sprint i run i do jujitsu every day just about and so yeah i surf i i definitely stay active as much as i can what about the surfing so i i recently so i lived up in san francisco most of my life and mm -hmm. i moved down to la to work with chris and i live by the beach i live out by venice beach and so i took up surfing i had a guy teach me how and I'm still struggling with it, mm -hmm. but I'm trying to get the hang of it. When did you pick up surfing? I grew up in New England, and so I started surfing. I had an old uh, lifeguard guy that was older than me that just for whatever reason said, hey, I'm going to teach you how to surf. Mm -hmm. And that was when I was 10 years old. So it was a real, a real help to me because that water, that familiarity with the water and comfort in the water is something that really tricks up a lot of people going through SEAL training because the, a lot of it is in the water and they, they come pretty close to drowning you in a lot of situations. And if you're not comfortable in the water, you're not going to make it through. So I was super comfortable in the water from growing up surfing in, in the winter time, cold water, uh, you know, hurricane swells up in new England. And so 
it was it was a real benefit for me that that guy you know reached out and said hey i'll teach you how to surf yeah it's, it's funny that you mentioned that because when i talk to people about surfing that's the one thing they say is that they're afraid of the ocean like they're afraid of drowning they're afraid of the waves tumbling you know sometimes you get under a wave and you just got to wait for it to stop before you're going to come up yeah it's interesting if you're not comfortable in the water surfing is not going to be fun for you mm -hmm. i i would tend to agree with that yeah absolutely <laughs> Uh, it's, I'm out of questions. I, think. I mean, I probably have a hundred more, but we don't want to hold them up all day. Yeah, no, it was, it was fun. Thank you for doing this. Thanks it's for having very, me. Yeah, we appreciate it. Sweet of you, and we'll um, we'll see you at the event. Awesome. Looking yeah. forward to it. Thanks, Jonko. All right. Thank thanks. you. Bye.